who felt violated by Al Franken. You think you're, you, that's that's some, somehow, uh, you know, reassuring to you? Right. That makes it better? Right. There was nothing about this that was focused on the victims. We say zero tolerance. Does that mean that every act deserves the death penalty, which was what we saw for Senator Franken here is the political death penalty. As predicted, Franken was a victim of the PC lynch mob. This was a crass political ploy. Democrats dumping Franken overboard because now that they can claim, hey, the moral high ground for 2018 and pursue allegations against Donald Trump and Roy Moore. And President Trump creating a media furor by endorsing Republican candidate Roy Moore. The president of the United States would rather have an accused child molester in the Senate than a Democrat. If you give money to President Trump or you give money to the Republican National Committee, you are giving money to Roy Moore and you are endorsing everything that Roy Moore stands for. I think the president's taking political risk. He doesn't need to. Uh, doing the Mitch McConnell thing, let Alabama decide, probably would be the best way. Are the media taking sides against Trump and more in Tuesday's election and tarring the entire Republican Party in the process? Have they held Franken and Conyers to the same standards? And the press reveals the real reason GOP Congressman Trent Franks abruptly resigned over an outrageous request to female staffers. We'll talk to two former Trump campaign officials, Corey Lewandowski and Dave Bossy, about this and the coverage of the president they helped elect. CNN touts a big exclusive about an explosive email to Donald Trump Jr., which turns out to be wrong. Why have there been so many media screw-ups in the Russia investigation? Plus, new reports on Harvey Weinstein using the press to protect him. And an actress charging Dustin Hoffman with disturbing sexual misconduct. I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. We didn't have to wait for the pundits to draw a partisan contrast when Al Franken resigned his Senate seat. The former Saturday Night Live star did it himself. I, of all people, am aware that there is some irony in the fact that I am leaving while a man who has bragged on tape about his history of sexual assault sits in the Oval Office, and a man who has repeatedly preyed on young girls campaigns for the Senate with the, with the full support of his party. Joining us now from New Hampshire to talk about this and the coverage of the president, Corey Lewandowski, Donald Trump's former campaign manager and advisor to a pro-Trump super PAC. And here in Washington, Dave Bossie, the former deputy campaign manager, president of Citizens United and a Fox News contributor. Their book is called Let Trump Be Trump, the inside story of his rise to the presidency. Corey, many liberal pundits adopting the Al Franken line. If he has to resign, how can the president endorse Roy Moore as battling sexual misconduct allegations from nine women, which he denies? Is it fair for the media to bring up this obvious discrepancy? Howie, there's a huge difference between Roy Moore and Al Franken. Al Franken was groping women while they were asleep. He thought it was a game. He had their hand on their breasts. He's taking pictures, sharing them on social media. That's one example. You know, in New Hampshire, Howie, there's something called street justice. You do that to somebody who's asleep, a woman, it's disgusting. He's a pig. He should have resigned. But ultimately, the people of Alabama have to decide if they want to elect a big government liberal or they want to elect a oh, conservative wait, wait. But you just, hold who's it. going you, to stand you up. You just pivoted from what Al Franken did was bad. No quarrel there. The Democrats helped push him out. And then when it comes to Roy Moore and the, the potentially more serious accusations, you say, oh, it's up to the voters. Well, Howie, look, I'm not convinced Al Franken's going to resign from the Senate. What day is he leaving? You know, he never gave us a day. This is all, this is all media driven. This is to let this story die down. Al Franken has not said which day he's leaving the Senate. In the coming days, weeks, months, he may be there for another two years. All and right. ultimately, if he does stay, the, the people of Minnesota will get to decide. But look, follow you may not believe this. These guys in D.C. aren't actually truth tellers. <laughs> follow up question for you, Dave Bussey. Is it fair for the press? following the Franken shot there, to revive the story from last year in the campaign. Sure. You were there that more than a dozen women made just, accusations against Donald Trump, which he denies. Sure. Let me just get to the facts of, of the Franken case. One, there is photographic evidence mm -hmm. and an admission, okay, on, on the Al Franken side. And on Judge Moore's side, there are accusations, but he says that those did not happen. And the one piece of evidence, the yearbook, we now know has been uh, tainted. So we, we don't have any evidence. 
evidence. One is clear photographic evidence, and another is so accusations that are made. Denied it, Absolutely. Uh, despite the fact that there were nine women. So now you, you let the, you don't think you that let that's... it. Uh, you let the voters of Alabama make the call for themselves, whether they think it's been adjudicated. All right. Corey, uh, the president has said repeatedly the Russia investigation is a witch hunt. It's ginned up by fake news. No, no hard evidence of Russian collusion, to be sure. But doesn't the Mike Flynn guilty plea show that this is a legitimate news story at the very least? Well, it's not a legitimate news story. And what Mike Flynn pled guilty to is lying to the FBI, which had nothing to do with the campaign, or Russia. And Wait. if Mike Flynn lied to the FBI or anybody else did, then they should be accountable for that, Howie. But that doesn't mean, and I was at the campaign from the beginning, Dave was there at the end. And we, you know, the reason we don't even talk much about the Russia investigation and let Trump be Trump is because it didn't occur during the campaign. There was no collusion. I never spoke to a Russian. There was no cooperation. And if somebody lied to the FBI about their contact with the foreign government, they should be held accountable. But it had nothing to do with the outcome of the campaign. That's the difference. Let me ask you, Dave, about a bunch of recent news stories. Some saying president's out of touch with reality. He creates an alternative universe. He privately questioning the Access Hollywood tape. New York Times Today says he watches up to six eight hours of TV a day, slurring his words in the Jerusalem speech, questioning his mental health. What does all this say to you about the coverage of this president? Well, it, we, we just have to go back in this past week, Howie, to look at the fake news divisions and what they've tried to do. Whether it's ABC News and Brian Ross, who the president said should be fired and never on television again for a, suspended. for a fake news story, but it drove the markets down 350 points and it set a media narrative based on a lie. That's the problem. Then you have the Deutsche Bank records uh, subpoena, supposed subpoena by uh, uh, the Mueller team, which was then uh, obviously said did never happen. Several have, organizations got that wrong. Many. And then we have uh, the Washington Post with Dave Weigel with this story last night of the empty arena in Pensacola, which, of course, was packed to the gills and had people waiting outside. Have we, have no, we have story after story after story of fake news. And, that, and that's, look, the New York Times today, all the fake news that's fit to print is what I say about them. They can't help themselves. They hate this president. They will never let him succeed. And that's why he uses Twitter and these speeches to speak directly to the American people. Well, I don't think it's fair to say that everything in every story is fake, and the New York Times story obviously but let's was try based to get, on interviews. Let's make the media just get it right for once, I agree. and then no, for once. we can. Then the president won't be on them so much. But they continue to feed right. him. Let me get to some uh, details in your book, Let Trump Be Trump, um, Corey. The, the early in the campaign, the president attacks John McCain. I prefer people who aren't shot down. You told him that he needed to hold a press conference right away and clean this up. He held a press conference. He didn't. He didn't back off. And you thought the campaign was over. That seemed to set a template for the media saying, oh, the Trump can't possibly survive this. You're exactly right. And what I learned on that campaign and what the American people learned is he's going to fight for everything he believes and he's going to double down. And what Donald Trump did on that campaign, in particular on this issue, is he raised the awareness that veterans needed more help in the state of Phoenix, Arizona, in the state of Phoenix, in the state of Arizona, because the Phoenix VA was a disaster. And that became a story. And if you look at disproportionately, the veterans supported Donald Trump, the first responders support Donald Trump, our military supports Donald Trump. We talk about that in the book because he is willing to talk about issues on the campaign trail, and now is the presidency and that no other candidate was willing you to. You have set up my next question for Dave, which is the Supreme Court just cleared enforcement of the travel ban after many months. After the San Bernardino murders, uh, the Trump campaign issued a statement that called for a temporary ban on Muslims entering the United States. You guys right. For us, the decision was simple. We wanted none of the other candidates to move to the right of us on immigration. But the ban on Muslims was being so offensive that it didn't make it into the travel ban. And you deal with it as if it's just a cold political calculation. President Trump's been a, somebody who is for border security, for America first national security. So whether it's build the wall, whether it's the Kate Steinle uh, verdict last week, whether it's the Supreme Court voting seven to two last week to allow his ban to right. uh, uh, be I'm upheld. Talking about a campaign position that you're defending as smart politics, it, it, which uh, offended a lot of people. This guy has the best political instincts in America. He, President Trump is a master 
master at understanding having his finger on the pulse of the American people. And Corey and I, we, we, say, we talk about it in the book. When we're wrong, he lets us know we're wrong. But we think as the political professionals, oh, we know what to do. And uh, he does. And so Corey and I talk about in the book how we were wrong. And we have to admit it because he has unbelievable instincts. Let me get to this. Uh, Corey, you tell the story in the book about Donald Trump's reaction when Paul Manafort, now under indictment, obviously, tried to keep him off the Sunday shows, cleaning it up a little bit. Donald Trump saying, I'll go on TV anytime I damn blanking want, and you won't say another blanking word about it. Uh, didn't want to tone it down. I know guys like you with your hair and your skin. Now, you say in the book you think Manafort, who essentially replaced you as a bad guy, a little bit of score settling here? No, Howie, this is, look, it's a truthful book. And what Dave and I talk about in the book is exactly what he just mentioned, which is Donald Trump has the best instincts. He is the best messenger. And for anybody who tried to change him, if you remember at that time in the campaign, Paul Manafort was down in Florida telling the Republican National Committee members, I'm going to remake Donald Trump. You're going to see Donald Trump 2.0, a presidential Donald Trump, which is what every other political operative in the world wanted to do because they thought that's what the American people wanted. What we say is, let Trump be Trump. He has been a phenomenal success. He knows what the American people want. He brought that message directly to them, and that, in large part, is why he was elected, because he's authentic. He's the blue-collar billionaire. He sees what the people want, and he delivers it for them. All right, I'll put you down as a true believer. Uh, Dave, in the book, end of the campaign, at that time when he did, you did have a number of women coming out with the harassment allegations against then-candidate Donald Trump, he said, according to your reporting, uh, you were there, uh, those false accusers are killing us with the women's vote. And then you say Kellyanne Conway responded, it's not that, it's that you fat chain fat shamed Miss Universe, well, women spend billions trying to lose weight. So those kind of tweets against Alicia Mercado at that time were kind of the precursor to the tweeted insults and feuds he's engaged in as president, which you probably wish he would stop. I mean, he may have good instincts, but doesn't he pick unnecessary fights? You know what? I, I, I am one of those during the campaign. I told him many times not to, not to tweet, and he uh, felt that it was the right thing to do, and he ended up being right. And that's why you, letting Trump be Trump, the name of our book, is yes. about him telling the American people, speaking directly to them. So, sir, sure, would I want him to not tweet here or there? Absolutely. But he understands what he's doing, and he gets it, and he's right, and I, th and I like him doing it. All right. Uh, let me get a break here. More with our guests when we come back. And later, the latest botched story on the Russia investigation as CNN corrects a much-touted... Well, he told me not to make the trip. He said, you know, you can't get on the airplane. Uh, that'd be a problem for us. Or you're and gone. So I'm going to ask you not to go on the trip. And you know what I said? We're already wheels up, baby. We're out. <laughs> you have great respect for Jeff Zucker. Uh, I know your, your listeners aren't going to like that, but I do. I think he's a good man. Um, but, but, you know, look, I think what, you know, what I tried to help to do there was this was immediately following what is called Billy Bush Weekend, which we detail in the book. And what we did there is Anderson Cooper then had a sit-down, one-on-one interview with Melania Trump where she was very candid and set mm -hmm. the record straight about what she thought about the story surrounding her husband uh, in that Billy Bush weekend. Right. And the day that Dave and I talk about in the book is where Donald Trump won the election. He won that at the St. Louis debate following that Billy Bush weekend let where me, he took his message let me directly jump in to Hillary Clinton. We're short on time. So you say during the campaign in the book that Hope Hicks, now the communications director, had to perform what service for Donald Trump? And by the way, Mr. Lewandowski, were you not covering up your own complicity in that service? Yes, I was, actually. Look, I, you know, I had to go get the McDonald's run. I had, there's nothing on the campaign that I didn't do. Howie, there were well, five I'm talking people about, on the campaign. You say, that came to, you, say you all had to, clothes, you had to press his clothes. pants, yes. Look, Howie, if, if I get to steam the clothes or I get to get the McDonald's or I get to pull the car around with five people on a presidential campaign, there's nothing you don't do. And, and I did it all. Hope did it all. Dan did it all. George Ujikos did it all. That's what you do on a, on a small... We didn't have the juggernaut of the Clinton uh, cabal, <laughs> 900 people. There was five of us. I didn't even know it could be done while you're still wearing the pants. Dave, <laughs> uh, you write, both write that you went to see the president last May. You thought from the groundwork that you were both going to be offered senior White House jobs. You were relieved when that offer didn't come. Why? Why wouldn't you have wanted well, to go both, into the White House? You know, I won't speak for Corey on this, but for me, for my family, for my own health, you know what? I, wanted, I want to serve the president how best I can, whether it's from the outside, uh, or from the inside. And, and Corey and I are kind of soldiers in that movement. We would do whatever he wants. Uh, but uh, for me, it was, a, it was a relief that I, would, I didn't have to go in, and he was protecting us from potentially a staff shakeup that was coming. Corey, I got half a minute. 
Sa same exact thing. Look, Dave and I both have young families. We put a lot of time into the campaign. The families made the sacrifice. And working inside the White House is like being in the Super Bowl. It's the greatest privilege for a political operative. But it also is a massive amount of commitment because it's 18 hours a day, seven days a week, no breaks. So I think Dave and I are great surrogates on the outside. For this president, we can say and do things you can't do if you're inside that building. Uh, excellent point. And you do get to spend a little bit more time with your families when you're not promoting the book. Dave Bossy here. Corey Lewandowski in New Hampshire. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Ahead, a new and damaging account from an actress who says Dustin Hoffman sexually assaulted her several years ago, many years ago. But first, CNN discloses a damaging email involving Donald Trump Jr. and WikiLeaks, but the story falls apart. CNN was promoting a major scoop. The breaking news this morning we have to report to CNN exclusive in the Russia investigation. Donald Trump, his son Donald Trump Jr. and others in the Trump organization, they received an email in September 2016 offering a decryption key and website address for hacked WikiLeaks documents. But that, as CNN had to acknowledge, turned out to be wrong. The unsolicited email to Don Jr. actually came 10 days later. So rather than offering secret access to undisclosed information, it simply pointed the campaign to hack messages that had already been made public. Joining us now to analyze the coverage. And then CNN Molly apologized Trump. just a little while ago. They apologized. Oh, thank you, CNN. Thank you so much. <laughs> you should have been apologizing for the last two years. That was the president the other night. Joining us now to analyze the coverage, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist. Jessica Tarlov, senior director at Bustle.com. And Mara Liason, White House correspondent for NPR, all our Fox News contributors. Molly, how serious was this blunder by CNN about the president's son? Well, it's hard to underestimate or overstate, I should say, how much they were hyping this story. This was the first evidence of smoking gun, of actual collusion between Trump and Russia to steal the election. And so that was how the, the news played out. And a lot of people sort of fell for it. Turned out that it was like so many other stories that we've gotten on this narrative, a complete nothing burger. I mean, the email was from some random person who was sharing publicly available information. This is the pattern for so many of these stories. I mean, this is not the first time it's happened to CNN. It's not even the first time it happened this week that a major story blew right. up like this. That at some point you actually have to start asking, maybe the real scandal is how the media fell for this Russia-Trump collusion narrative and how they've been involved in perpetuating Well, MSNBC and CBS also uh, picked up the story saying they had confirmed it. But on this question of, you know, there's been this run of media mistakes. ABC's Brian Ross last week, as Molly points out, uh, uh, earlier CNN had to retract and fire employees over Anthony Scaramucci's story. Uh, and the president saying fake news CNN made a vicious and purposeful mistake. I'm not saying it's purposeful, but it's not looking good for the news business in terms of these Trump stories. No, it absolutely isn't. And I think this is why there are a lot of people on both sides of the aisle who are saying actually maybe there wasn't a Russia-Trump collusion story in the first place. I mean, there are certainly things that raise eyebrows. We know we've seen a number of indictments. Obviously, the Mueller investigation is finding things and characters like Paul Manafort and uh, Carter Page are never going to win Citizen mm -hmm. of the Year. Mike Flynn. And Mike yeah. Flynn, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I do think it is... Uh, it's difficult, and uh, we did it also at Fox. We had one with the forgery on the Roy Moore story, which we'll get Talk to about later. That later yeah. um, but I, I do think it's tough, and it, and it just feeds Donald Trump absolutely, and he can make that case. And gives him plenty of ammunition. And Mara, CNN uh, says reporter Manu Raju, uh, who we just saw, I won't be disciplined because the sources, multiple sources, who told him about this email got it wrong. But he thought it was solid enough to air, and CNN obviously hadn't seen the emails. Does that get him off the hook? Well, you know, what he, what, what he said in the clip you played was in September. But CNN also had put on its website September 4th, when it actually was September 14th. Right. And maybe that was a typo, but there's a big difference because no, at one point CNN it wasn't public. Was. Right, yeah. and, and it wasn't. But I think that if the pressure is to come up with scoops, especially scoops that are going to show that Donald Trump colluded, smoking gun scoops, you're going to be held to a very high bar because the president of the United States has a explicit strategy to delegitimize the media and say that everything's fake and this investigation is fake. So, yes, every time the media screws up, it's really bad. Meanwhile, a number of conservative pundits uh, following the president's lead and criticizing, attacking the FBI. Uh, one uh, bit of commentary that's gotten a lot of attention has been replayed on other cable news channels. Came from Fox's Greg Jarrett uh, talking about the FBI on Hannity. And Mueller has been using the FBI 
as a political weapon. And the FBI has become America's secret police. Secret surveillance, wiretapping, intimidation, harassment, and threats. It's like the old KGB that comes for you in the dark of the night, banging through your door. Former Republican Congressman Mike Rogers said those comments were dangerous. Um, did he go too far? Well, I mean, uh, sure, that's that's a quite extreme thing to say. At the same time, I think journalists like to think of ourselves as people who hold people in authority accountable. And there is so much that has happened for the last few decades with the politicization of the FBI. And this is something we've seen in our history, a highly politicized FBI, where people have to come in and kind of rein it in. And there are problems with the Mueller probe. And I think it would make sense for journalists, rather than just uncritically accepting everything that comes out of the Mueller probe or uncritically accepting how it's run, maybe pose some questions. I mean, even the, the things that we've seen that come out that concern it, just the hyper politicization of the people involved, that hasn't come through much media digging, but other just investigations. Just briefly, uh, it is fair to criticize the FBI, and Mueller has made mistakes, but um, comparing to the KG be, uh... I mean, it's reminiscent of what Donald Trump was saying on the campaign trail, where he was talking about the intelligence agencies and talking about uh, 1930s Germany. I mean, this is not how we do things. It's not how we talk. And there's there's middle ground between what Greg Jarrett said there and uh, a valuable criticism of the FBI. I mean, we just had Christopher Wray testify this week. We heard from Rod Rosenstein that the probe is going as expected, that the morale is not where it is, that it, this is not hyper-politicized. But we're not, we're not getting good information from the FBI. I mean, there are congressional overseers who are trying to get information Namely, was this Russian dossier used to secure a wiretap There's on an American really citizen? Much, if that's true, that's horrifying. And that's something much, the media should be digging into. Much more to say about this, but i got to get in another break. Up next, two top Democrats forced from Congress to the press play a role. And Al Franken's and John Conyers resigning. And later, how New York gossip column dug up dirt for Harvey Weinstein. The 88-year-old dean of the House resigned this week over accusations of sexual assault and harassment after the Detroit Free Press called on him to quit. Within 48 hours, with the Minneapolis Star Tribune demanding his resignation, Al Franken said he'd be giving up his seat. This after eight women accused the former comedian of sexual harassment. And that led many liberal pundits to make this argument. If the president admits publicly, as he has done on tape, that he assaulted women as a manner of habit because of his celebrity, saying he could get away with doing it and had done so, why shouldn't he resign today like Franken did? Molly, by taking those partisan shots at Donald Trump and Roy Moore, which Franken knew would be red meat for the media, did he distract journalists from the fact that he didn't apologize in that farewell speech? Well, I... <sighs> Yeah, I mean, there was so much to look at in that Franken speech, including the lack of the apology, sort of uh, accusing women of, of not telling the truth about what they had said about him. At the same time, I just think in general, the whole media approach here has been one of mob hysteria and one of trying to score partisan political points, as opposed to really thoughtful, reasoned debate about an important moment. It's really important to hold sexual harassers accountable. It's also important that we don't go overboard and remove all due process from some of these allegations. I mean, some of these stories are really not holding up journalistically to what you would like to see for the costs that they are incurring, like the, the destruction of people careers. Right. And after Franken announced that he's going to resign on a specified date, uh, specified date, there's been a sort of a theme in the media, well, maybe we went too far because, look, certainly what Franken did was utterly unacceptable, but you have some pundits saying, well, unwanted kissing, a little butt grabbing during photo ops, it's not in the same category as some of these others. That's what I'm starting to hear from much of the media. There, there's a huge problem, and there has been from day one with this, in blanket statements about sexual harassers. These guys are all bad guys. There are so many varying degrees. The fact that we even talk about Al Franken in the same conversation as a Harvey Weinstein is patently unfair and ridiculous. And it does society a disservice as well, because there are a number of people out there who now don't know the difference. They don't know the specifics of these stories. And when you're talking about people's careers, you need to know every single detail. Did he put his arm on his waist or did he rape her? Uh, that's an important distinction. <laughs> yeah. Do you think the media coverage of Franken, because in the beginning with that L.A. radio host Leanne Tweeden and the photo, which was, you know, cringe worthy, built to the point, the, the, the media coverage built to the point where he had to resign or was the press more following the lead of Democratic senators like Kirsten Gillibrand? I think in this case, the press was following the lead. And the reason why it's been so complicated and confusing is because the Democrats don't, haven't thought this through. 
Do they want to say that in every case, even when the facts are different, the consequence should be uniform, meaning off with your head, you're out of a job? Or do they want to set up a process, some kind of due process, where these things are adjudicated and you can tell the difference from a false accusation from a true one and one that's really not career ending and one that is? They haven't figured that out yet. Right now what they're saying is that anyone who has any accusation against them should lose their job and politically that's really risky for democrats on your point uh the, what broke the dam it seemed to me was politico uh, with the seventh accuser an unnamed former aide who said he forcibly like frank and forcibly kissed her back in 2006 and said supposedly it's my right as an entertainer no, he tried, no. but failed oh, okay. he, he moved didn't, in for a kiss but he didn't and make then there's it there's an eighth accuser named tina dupuy who wrote a very moving piece in the atlantic but she just said that during a photo op he grabbed her waist so your, your point is that we are treating too much of this as if it's all uh, worthy of the political death penalty? Yes, and, and it's not just that some of these allegations really don't stand up to a fireable offense, even maybe not even any punishment at all. It's just that the larger scene is just one of mob hysteria, and it's not helpful. It's so important for humans to have interaction, even in the workplace. And sometimes these are attempts at courtship that fail. Sometimes it's just dirty philandering, you know, things like this. There are differences here that are are not being well discussed in the media. And, and, and Mara, uh, John Conyers looked like nobody was going to tell him what to do and he wasn't going to get out. And I wonder what you think of the media coverage there, because I think the turning point was his former chief, deputy chief staff, Marion Brown, going on the Today Show and we could yeah. actually see the yeah. uh, the accusations from somebody. Yeah, who I think incredible. so. But there was also a settlement. There had been an actual process in Congress that Nancy Pelosi and others could look into, the Ethics Committee. But right now we've got a couple choices. We've got the Ethics Committee process, which people think is inadequate. We've got this kind of mob or pack mentality where his colleagues of a, of a member say, you're out of here. And then there's what the Republicans are proposing. Let the voters decide. You know, Al Franken, if he wanted to, could step down and run for his old seat. Uh, he could. <laughs> All right. So Republican Congressman Trent Franks, sudden resignation. And he yeah. said, well, I talked to two female staffers about surrogacy because my wife has been having infertility problems. But then the Associated Press reports he pressured one woman and offered her $5 million to carry his child. And Politico said these women, both of them, feared that he wanted to personally impregnate them. And <laughs> right. So did the press do its job here? I mean, this is the weirdest story yet. It was totally <laughs> weird. And the Handmaid's Tale comparisons were entertaining me to no end on Twitter. Um, it's a confusing story. Certainly when his statement came out, you kind of thought, oh, this is just a little sad. They had infertility problems close to your staff. Maybe you'd reach out to someone. And then we when this, the same thought uh, process. exactly. And yeah. I was like, and then the next day I was like, well, there's got to be something more because no one resigns right away. And Paul Ryan wrote that scathing letter. And right. you know, to get Paul Ryan really fired up, it's got to be super bad. Right. Um, $5 million. It's like a Robert Redford. Politicians movie. have so much money. But I just wanted to add to Mara's point. You know, yeah. what's different about corporate America is that you have a boss in the private sector that has the discretion to fire you in the public sector the voters are your boss and we are unless taking... unless the press gets everyone riled up and your own it party so colleagues on this one it wasn't because the press okay. this coming. is the democratic party thinking it needs the moral high ground and needs to get rid but of everyone the Republicans who has should go for a little more moral high ground with what's going on yeah, in alabama that's true too. more on this in a moment because coming up the press castigating the president for endorsing roy moore in tuesday's election despite the allegations of sexual misconduct that election is coming up folks and later another sexual assault allegation against Dustin Hoffman. But other allegations, President Trump created a media furor by endorsing Alabama's Republican Senate candidate and touting him Friday night at a Florida rally. And we want jobs, jobs, jobs. So get out and vote for Roy Moore. Moore has denied sexual harassment and assault allegations from nine different women, most of whom say he pursued them when they were teenagers. And Molly, Trump had been implicitly backing Roy Moore by a beating up on Doug Jones, his liberal Democratic opponent. But once he made an official endorsement, man, the media tried to hang those nine female accusers around the president's neck. Sure. And one of the things that was interesting was that the New York Times actually said like a week or two ago that Trump had endorsed more, and that wasn't actually true, which kind of made it less impactful when he act, when he finally did endorse more. It seemed like that had already been the media narrative going forward. But just in general, this race seems to be a rewrite of 2016, where everybody in D.C. and the political and media establishments agree 
agree that Republican voters in Alabama should voluntarily turn over a seat because of serious 40-year-old allegations of sexual misconduct. And I'm not sure that that's going to match the reality on the ground, and I'm not sure we're seeing good media coverage of what issues actually motivate the Alabama, Alabama voter, uh, how they're making their decisions. It's, it just seems very much like a similar thing of being out of touch with the dynamics. Right. On Nobody's the outside of Alabama seat to think there are any other issues except this. But even the conservative Wall Street Journal editorial page said the called on the president to disavow Roy Moore. Right. But the press is essentially casting them as this as Trump doesn't believe the women, the nine different women, as opposed to it's politics and he wants the Republican to win. Well, I think it's both for Donald yeah. Trump because he doesn't believe the 16 women who have said that he sexually harassed them, and he doesn't believe the nine who are saying about Roy Moore. And voters in Alabama don't either. The Washington Post poll showed 71 percent of Republican voters in Alabama don't believe the charges, and 63 percent of Trump voters in Alabama didn't believe the charges against him. You know, with the issues with media reporting, and when you find holes in a story, people are just looking for their hook. They're looking for the moment that they can say the whole thing is made up because there was an added date, right? With Beverly Young Nelson. She added the date and the location. So the whole thing is a lie. Well, Romar is innocent. Let's talk about that. So Beverly Young Nelson is uh, one of the nine accusers. She's the one who's uh, represented by Gloria Allred. Mm -hmm. And it turns out she's acknowledged that in this signing of her high school yearbook, which showed she had some mm -hmm. relationship with Roy Moore at least, she had added the date and the place. And that does muddy the waters. Is it a big deal? I don't think it's that big a deal. I also think this whole thing about, about uh, when did the president endorse Roy Moore the minute the primary was over, he said Roy Moore was make, going to make a great senator. But he no, didn't... the first statement was, uh, if these allegations are yes. true, Judge Moore should yes. step aside. But Written before statement. the allegations.